13. Report from Babylon 5 control mission only partly successful. Isogi terminated, but unit was destroyed before he could leave station for Mars. Is the Bureau at hazard? Control does not believe so. Belief is not enough. He is to follow up until he is certain. 13 out. On an all new Babylon 5. A rebellion on Mars colony. Babylon 5 is neutral territory. Everything we believe in is in jeopardy. On the next Babylon 5. You have transmissions holding. Patch incoming signal. Full audio and video decode. Purple files accessed. What you are about to see has never been shown to anyone outside the break house. out there in podcast land welcome to gray 17 a babylon 5 podcast a part of the front row network and npr illinois community voices we are a group of newbies and first ones who are watching every episode of babylon 5 and we have reached season two a spider in the web i am scott and with me as always is justin emily andrew john jesse evan nicole and Blake. Before we get into the episode, a uh, couple quick reminders. We are uh, still very active on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You can find all the links below. We do have our Patreon, which is at patreon.com slash gray17podcast. Again, link below. We're selling our merch at Redbubble. Again, link below. And we have a new link below as well, too, and that is our sponsor of this show, which is Sock and Key. Sock and Key is a mom and pop shop who are helping Helping to turn your likeness into your favorite cartoon figure. You've probably seen them already because it is uh, our new figures that we are showing on our social media as well, too. So if you use the referral code GRAY17, you can get a 20% off your first order. So go to Sock and Key, get yourself for, I guess, Valentine's Day, some great um, cartoons of you and your significant other, and you can get 20% off that with using the referral code GRAY17. Thanks to Sock and Key for supporting the show, as well as making us look not so hideous in our caricatures. We really do appreciate you not making us look too ugly, especially people like Mike and I. We, we're, we you tend to be kind of ugly, so. I can barely recognize that. myself. Yeah, you're a Narn with hair. It's great. You look nothing like me. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I'm going to read a review, and that review is going to be the winner of our John Sheridan action figures. Thank you to everyone who did the reviews. We're going to do some more giveaways for that as well, too. Uh, coming down the line, I've got a, I've got another guy here who's in a box who needs to find a good home. So we'll be announcing that contest here fairly soon as well, too. So without further ado, the winner review. Gray 17 is awesome. And yeah, no, I did pick randomly, I promise. I cannot express how much I'm enjoying this podcast. I find the preparation that Scott and all his friends put into it so amazing. I can't wait for each episode to hear the girls go off on the guys when they tangentially get into other sci-fi references, which Jesse and Nicole aren't familiar with. Hope I got that right. I thought I heard that Emily is a sci-fi fan. I love that the group are a long time old friends and can jab on each other without worry. Jesse's creative use of the F word cracks me up. The research that is put in the episodes by looking at JMS's usernets from the 90s as well as the books and articles that the team has looked up is really getting them noticed. I bet the interviews that the group has managed to get is only the beginning. My one wish is that I could submit questions and comments for review after I hear it. Sometimes the discussions they have prompt comments and questions I hadn't thought of previously. From the first podcast, I I immediately knew I had to become a producer, Gray Council member, when they opened a Patreon account. I hope that everybody aboard, even Ivanova Chuckle Nugget, stays throughout the series. It'll be wonderful to hear how they love every character on the cast as they progress. I applaud your ability to keep spoilers at bay. It really makes the insights of the first one so genuine. Keep it up. P.S. We are strictly an Android household, but I opened up an Apple account just so I could do this. Thank you, Rosie Bayless, for your review. And go ahead and email me at gray17podcast at gmail.com, and we'll talk about getting you your 
John Sherrod, an action figure. And for those who did not get selected, thank you so much for leaving a review. Keep doing it. It absolutely helps us grow the show. And again, there will be other contests coming very, very soon. And Rosie, I love your idea of being able to submit comments after the show. And we're going to work on that as well, too. I just want to send a shout out to all of our continued supporters on Facebook and YouTube. I was going to say a uh, shout out to our Patreons as well. Um, we keep getting new Patreons, which blows my mind. We appreciate it. And we're really glad to have you. And on that note, I would encourage our current Patreons and future Patreons to please submit questions, submit voicemails. We're happy to answer your questions and whatever they may be. And that's one way to do it. So let's go ahead and dive into a spider in the web. And Nicole, I believe you have a synopsis for us. I do. So a spider in the web. This is an action packed episode that will leave you full of questions. We start the episode with a glimpse of the San Diego wastelands and an ominous woman giving out commands to someone to complete their mission. As we see someone crawl out of a shipping container on Babylon five, as the episode progresses, we're introduced to an old friend of Talia winters, Taro Isogi. He's meeting with Amanda Carter to discuss a plan to help Mars gain independence peacefully. The Senate commands Sheridan to look into these proceedings, which doesn't sit right with him. Shortly after the meeting, Isogi is murdered and Talia winters, Winters sees into the murderer's mind, which not only makes her the next target, but opens up a web of questions. As the episode progresses, we learn that there was a secret experiment called the Lazarus Project. Psychor may not be as trustworthy as Talia thinks, and Sheridan shares a huge bombshell with Garibaldi that can shake all of their beliefs. We also learn about the Takar, the Free Mars Movement, and witness a spark between Talia and Garibaldi begin to burn. And for those playing the home game, yes, there's like 17 different Mass Effect references in that synopsis. So some Mass Effect uh, writers had some fun with this episode. So let's go ahead and go into first impressions. And Justin, I know you have been chomping at the bit because I'm sure you had, I don't know how to say this without not being PG-13, but you got off on this, didn't you, Justin? Didn't you? Honestly, yeah, this this tickled all my fancies. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. <laughs> tell, uh, tell us what tickled the most. You know what? I think I love the fact that we finally get the the name of the group that has been kind of the sh- behind the scenes uh, EarthGov group Bureau 13. And that's something that I think we're going to be hearing a lot of and uh, kind of be exploring a lot of here going, not just in this episode, but in future episodes. I also didn't know that... I don't, well, and I guess that a lot a lot of this episode had Terminator vibes to me, which is pretty cool. I honestly thought that when first he pulled off his arm and or his hand and it was like a cyborg hand, I was like, this is straight up Terminator shit. And I love it. One thing that um, that I really liked was really good development with both Talia and Sheridan. And then Amanda Carter is actually, I think, a very interesting character who I hope we see more of if, as the story of Mars develops. Um, one quick thing that I would like to kind of drop in there is I like the Edgar Rice Burroughs reference with I'm glad her somebody got is, it. I'm a big fan of Edgar Rice Burroughs. I used to read the John Carter novels and stuff like that as a kid. And the fact that her great great grandfather was named John Carter and was the first pilot of the first colony ship to Mars, as soon as that happened, I was like, that is pristine. And I love the fact that JMS wove that in there. So those are just some of my first impressions. I'll have so much more to talk about when we get to the main discussion. And I'm glad you brought the Terminator. Our friends over at Gray Sector Podcast, and they're not going to release this episode for a while because they like record a year in advance. It's kind of weird. But they called the guy in this episode Terminator Henry Winkler. And I, I'm I'm worth it. I'm good with that. <laughs> that is so Honestly, accurate. I, I was. You I know was, what? I for a second I thought it was Henry Henry yeah, Winkler. Yeah, go check it out. I didn't say. think. I didn't think it was Henry Winkler. I was going back to the Hans and Franz guys from season one. Like to me, it would just kind of pop like that way for me. But Blondfuck one and Blondfuck two. Yep. Right. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Which now, and I'm sorry to derail for a second. Were they Bureau 13? Question mark. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Is Homefront is Homefront name... Bureau 13? Yeah. Their name will live on forever as Blondfuck one and Blondfuck are... two. They definitely were not the warriors. <laughs> God. Anyone? Not, yeah. I got it. Uh, Emily, first impressions, please save us. Yeah, I it was okay. I wasn't really that into this episode. Oddly enough, 
I spent most of the episode trying to figure out why Carter was so familiar. And then I realized she was Carol on Maud. And I happen to love Maud and B. Arthur. So. <laughs> See, for me, you had the guy from Die Hard. And I haven't seen Die Hard. And the chick from Swamp Thing. It was and the crossover of the Swamp 80s. Thing. Sorry, ah. I haven't seen them. So, yeah. But I have seen Mod, all of it. I own the full series on DVD, actually. So I got that going for me. It tells us our, our tastes. I, I really go to Swamp Thing, and you go to the Golden Girls. So. And no Andrew. one's mentioned Jessica Walters yet either. There are no <laughs> Arrested Development yeah. fans in here? I'm stepping on my shit. I was, ah. well, was going to mention it too. But... Mallory Archer herself. <laughs> Andrew. First impressions, go ahead. Yeah, so speaking of the 80s, Grace Ector likened it to Terminator. I likened likened it to RoboCop in a way. I really liked this episode. It's the sh- It seems like the show's finally starting to pick up again. Uh, I thought it was a great episode for Talia. We kind of have a little insight on like, kind of what she's dealing with. Like uh, For me, it kind of seems like she might be uh, struggling with her loyalty to Psychor. So that'll be interesting to see where that goes. John, first impressions. I also like this episode. Um, I don't know if it's because it followed the long dark, so it didn't really have a high bar to clear. Um, but it did have a lot of positives going for it. Even um, Sans Londo, which is you know always a strike against it. Um, it did. We did get some cool information, and we did get to see the San Diego wastelands, which was interesting. There's obviously, to Justin's point, a whole lot of intrigue and a, a whole lot of um, you know that plot that we can get into. So there was a lot actually going for it that I enjoyed. Probably wouldn't say it's in my top ten, but a stronger one of the second season from, from what we've seen so far. So more to discuss later on, but overall I enjoyed it. Oh, and yes. shout out to Jessica Walters. Yes. Lucille Bluth herself, Mallory Archer herself. As soon as I saw her, I immediately lit up. Jesse, first impressions. It was, yeah, it was an episode. <laughs> um, the hate comments gonna, are going to roll in. It's going to be great. I know. Um, I didn't, you know, it was, it was fine. We got a lot of information. We got some new plot um, for the future to see exactly. JMS is really good about bringing in new things that we have no idea what's going to happen or what turn it's going to take. So it was, it was a good, I mean, it was a good episode. I didn't, I didn't hate it or love it. I just an episode. I got through it. I did see the lady from Bree Mars. What was her name? Carter. Amanda Carter. Carter. She's been in like a creep show and the thing. She was like, so I, I recognized her from a lot of different um, movies. So it was kind of cool to see her. And yeah, I learned a lot about Talia. If you were a young 80s boy, you saw a lot of her. <laughs> Nicole, first impressions. That's creepy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually really liked this episode. Um, I thought there was a lot of nuggets it gave us. Some of our perceptions of the psychor were kind of answered in this one um there was a lot of uh questions left after the episode was over uh we got to see a different side of talia a little bit more in depth i really liked her dynamic with garibaldi you can tell they're kind of liking each other and they're vibing which i'm shipping that by the way sheridan kind of really grew on me in this episode i feel like you know i've been poo-pooing him from the beginning because i'm a sinclair stan but i gotta say like I, I kind of really started to like him a little bit more in this episode. I feel like um, he was really knowledgeable. He was really uh, informative and he taught us a lot of things or told us a lot of things that we didn't know about. But yeah, overall, I really liked it. Oh, and Ivanova's hair was lighter in this episode and it looked really pretty. So that was another thing I picked up on. Even though I have a big girl crush on her, I'm starting to get a little bit more of a girl crush on Talia. I'm just going to say that. So it left me with a lot of questions, though. So I'm excited to discuss it further. It's the voice, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And being in radio, voices kind of do it for me. So her like her voice is like top notch. (laughs) So Justin, the conspiracy theories do it for him. For you, it's the voices. And the music and the music. Don't forget that. Uh, Let's go over to our first ones. Uh, Kevin, first impressions. This is a good episode. It's got a lot of guest stars in it that are recognizable to people. James Shigeta from Die Hard that we've already mentioned is in this and Jessica Walter and uh, Jeff Conaway who was in Greece, I believe. Nope. Can so, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot in this. I mean, there's, there's a lot of nuggets uh, in, in this that seem like a new, a new influx of, of storyline just waiting to be explored further later on. So Mike, what do you got? 
Yeah, I like this one too. It wasn't my favorite by any means, but I think it was still a very solid episode with, you know, it's a, a, an all star guest guest actor cast and, and solid performances pretty much all the way around. I mean, uh, even even the discount wish.com Terminator did a decent job of, uh, you know, putting in the, the, the acting chops. And uh, yeah, that was, it was good. Solid sci fi premise, lots of mystery. Blake? So I, I had to ponder what I'd say about this because I, I like the episode. I think it's a good one. There's some solid world building in it um, with some stuff, but it's kind of hard, you know, as we always don't want to spoil anything or where things are heading. So it's kind of, this is kind of one of those, and we've had a few of these where it's a little bit hard to talk about mm-hmm. our thoughts or our impressions with the episode without giving away or tipping too much. So th- this is one of those for me uh, with some of the stuff in it and um, even some of the uh, guest actors who appeared in this one. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. But I, I think overall, it, it's a decent enough episode. Yeah, I, I hear you on that. The first ones had a little bit of a side chat saying no illusions this time, guys. No illusions. But I will say there's some fun things in this episode. We get Talia for the first time, really, in season two, which is nice to see her back. Again, I'm an old 80s kid. So when I see San Diego... I think immediately to Captain Power, another JMS show, because uh, it just lo- the model work just looks like it was taken straight out of Captain Power. Uh, but no, it's a, it's a fun one, and I'm looking forward to hearing you guys' conversations, and I'm looking forward to watching some of you try to string red yarn all over the place. It's going to be great. John, what do you got? Well, we can start with uh, talking about the, the Mars storyline, which, you know, we've heard and seen some before and we've talked about, and, you know, I thought was interesting. And then this episode obviously gave us way more um, into it. And, you know, I got a real like uh, sense of uh, colonialism question, right? So earth has populated Mars. Now people have flat out grown up on Mars and, you know, probably consider themselves more Martian than, than from earth. And so they're obviously trying to rise up and, you know, much like the story of America itself, right. We're no longer British. We're our own thing. We don't need you anymore. We don't want you anymore. Don't interfere with our matters. And it's interesting to see, although not surprising, how that dynamic is shake, shaking out, right? So uh, I've at least always said that it seems like Earth are the bad guys. And at every step of the way, they keep showing themselves to be just that. And in this instance, with Mars trying to essentially declare and find its own independence, and you have this free Mars group, which, I mean, we can dive into further. Um, you know, at first I was surprised. It seemed like Sheridan at the end there was siding with free Mars, um, or at least siding with them being independent because, you know, again, shout out Jessica Walters, RIP, when she came on as a center and said, Hey, will you do this for me? You know, we need you to check this out. You know, he really pushed back and, and gave, you know, which was shocking to see pre nine 11 that I don't want to spy on civilians. And, you know, her argument being what we've heard since nine 11 was, well, you have to, it's for the safety and for the benefit of all of us, we have to give up some of our individual liberties. But then at the end of the episode, when he was, he was telling uh, Ms. Carter there, you know, basically, Hey, you know, no, we won't report it. Do you think you can close this deal? I think you need to go after it. I got a real strong pro free Mars vibe from Sheridan. So I know we're not predictions yet, but it seems like after this episode, that's going to be much more of a massive point here in season two. And it'll be interesting to see which characters come down on which side. Um, I know he was assassinated, but you know, he was trying to, uh, what was his name? So yeah, I was trying to, um, say, yeah, you know, while I'm here, I can talk to and negotiate with all these other species and try to get them on board. So, um, I kind of, I love what we got from this episode, but I'm really looking forward to that being um, kind of interrogated more throughout the season. I love to hear what you guys think too, as you're going along with this, the difference between Sinclair and Sheridan on this one, because we've seen Sinclair talk to senators a lot and have him get marching orders from them. And I think Sheridan handled it a little bit differently this time. Justin. I think a whole lot of this from what you're saying, John comes from the, you know, we kind of get a revelation that John, that Sheridan doesn't seem to really trust a whole lot of what's going on in EarthGov because of his Bureau 13 investigations. And we don't really find that on, out until the end of the episode. But I think that a whole lot of the aspect of where Mars is coming from is they had the rebellion. It failed. We heard a lot about it in season one, and then it just kind of petered off and we really didn't hear much about it. And then we find out that it failed, Earth won, and now some of the people from that movement are trying to pick up the pieces and carry on their independence movement. But their main issue 
is they don't have access to resources. They are completely reliant upon Earth. And I think that's one thing that's interesting about Taro's plan is trying to make Mars self-sufficient so then they can assert their independence a little more. And I really, and by the time we got towards the end where, you know, Sheridan comes, you know, comes clean to Garibaldi about everything that he's been investigating and his own personal hobbies that, it really doesn't then surprise me that Sheridan's kind of more wanting to assist Mars along the way, but he's got to be very careful because he's under a very uh, watchful eye. So, Nicole. One thing, too, that I noticed that um, when Carter and Sheridan were talking uh, in the very beginning, like when he went to go check on her and see how she was doing or whatever and talk to her, she even said when they were talking about the murder or whatever, she even said like, it could be the Senate or it could be the Mars government behind it. Like, I feel like her and Sheridan were kind of on the same page, like, cause he didn't want to like do what the Senate told him. Cause he was like, well, they're civilians. They can have their discussions here. It's a neutral zone. And then when he went, to her, I feel like they were kind of both on that same wavelength and I could be totally wrong, but like she even said, oh, it could have been the Senate or it could have been, you know, the Mars government, like who killed him um, before they learned about Robocop. So that's what I'm calling him, by the way. I know he has a name, Abel, whatever his name was, but Abel Horn. Yeah. John? Yeah, I don't know if anyone else saw this. So, uh, you know, Justin, you're talking about that conversation at the end with Garibaldi when he was talking about his um, hobbies, if you will. Obviously, this is way long ago, but I was like, is this dude in QAnon? Like literally all he was describing, he was like, oh, yes, all of these <laughs> conspiracies and all of this other stuff. I thought, oh, God, here comes the tinfoil hat. The captain's gone. This is it. No, just me. All right. No, I kind of felt that way, too. I yeah. Like, oh, oh, what, what's this development? Why are con- like, is he interested in conspiracy theories because, you know, he's there might be nuggets of truth buried in them or is he into conspiracy theories because you know some people just are very creative yeah i was really wondering the reasoning behind it well it also made him seem a little paranoid like he doesn't trust anybody you know i mean this is the fifth babylon station and given the history with the other side probably be paranoid too so i just think a whole lot of it comes to where he knows there's something seriously wrong uh within earth gov and he's i think just wants to do the right thing get to the bottom of it and try and you know if there are any machinations try and do whatever he can to prevent it so it kind of well, a lot of it kind of yeah he can kind of come off maybe a little crazy or a little tinfoil hatty but I think he's, you know, just trying to do the right thing. You're just saying that because he's your avatar on the show now that he's going my new favorite character. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Jesse. I will say I was pleasantly surprised because at the end where he was trying to talk um, Robocop out of his gun and he was like, come on, just put it down. And I'm like, oh, here we go again. Like we did the same thing with Sinclair last time. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that it did not work. And it made me a little bit, I felt like it was a little more realistic. Like I, you know, we do have, you know, the teams that go in and try to negotiate with people. And I mean, it's a real thing, but I was like, oh, we're just going to have another captain that just sweet talks his way into, you know, everybody behaving. And he didn't. And I was like, yeah, okay. Okay. It gave me a little bit more respect for the writing and for the show. I thought he was going to end up shooting himself. I actually wrote that down. I was like, oh, here we go. Now he's going to want out of this madness in his mind. He's going to shoot himself. And then the fact that he put a cap in Sheridan was even better. <laughs> right. He tried. Actually, surprised you guys aren't harping on the whole Sheridan just happens to know everything about everything because that this yeah. to me was another pretty prime example of that. Yeah. Like, I didn't want to be the only one to that one every episode. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, but yet, he didn't he didn't know how to find the I uh, will use Nicole's euphemism. We didn't know how to find Robocop. Garibaldi had to help him do it. No, Garibaldi yes. moved up the door and then shared him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was funny. He's like, let the wizard do it. And all he did was break the door. Right. Yeah, yeah. but he did know exactly how to arrange the chairs in that conference center, apparently. Although it was Vanova that actually did it. So well, but at least that's given with the background, his story about meeting them, right? Yeah, he was first contact. 
Yeah. Did Maybe anyone that- else think TARDIS when he was talking about how the cloud showed up and it was beautiful on the inside and everything else? I'm like, yeah. You made some Time Lords. Is that what you did there? <laughs> uh, random question. I know it's not questions, but this is an easy one. Was Talia wearing a new outfit or have we seen that before? Because I didn't recognize it at first glimpse. I don't know. I'm not the fashion guy. I think I remember her seeing it before or wearing it before. I have no idea. It looked familiar. Yeah, it's at least similar to what she had on before. She I see you're years. not the fashion guy. I've heard you talk in lengths about uniforms. Like, <laughs> you can tell me from beginning to end what color they are and what they do and blah, blah, he blah. He doesn't know so, female fashion. Yeah. I, I know that the okay, new uniforms it, on season it. two has red piping, which season one did not have. See, and tell me you're not the fashion guy, but you can give me little details like that. Blake yeah. brought that one up first. But. Am I the only one who's going to say it? Why is Garibaldi just follows on with the creepiness from Franklin from last episode? She's like, oh, I just watched my mentor and my father. She didn't say that at first. Like, oh, this guy just died. And Garibaldi's like, what's up, girl? We riding this elevator together? I knew this was going to come up. Time out. Time out. I've got to stop this. It was the other way around this time. He started doing it. But as soon as she pointed out that she was not in the mood, he backed the hell off. Mm -hmm. And then he he injected humor, which she appreciated. So he handled that well. And then there was a Dr. Touchy this time. (laughs) Sure, he wasn't rapey hands, but then the writers paid it off. And then all of a sudden, sorry, Nicole, not buying that ship either. Now, all of a sudden, they're like, oh, do you want to have tea with me? It was like, what happened to the creepy guy in the elevator? He made one dead joke and you forgot about it. (sighs) Anyways, I'll get off my soapbox. It would have been nice to know how far he was going to go with that because he was just going to talk about, you know, an interesting life he led. I mean, he wasn't necessarily shooting his shot. Every oh, he was a hundred percent shooting his shot, but it wasn't, it was it wasn't creepy though. Like to me, I, I didn't catch creep vibes. Like I did with Franklin last week. Like I, I it, there, he continuously tries to, to hit on her and he has done so since like the very first episode that we ever saw them together. And I don't, I don't know. I don't get creep vibes. I get very, I don't know. I get a little wholesome, like kind of boy crush type. Vibes. Okay, so the next time you take a new job and a dude at that office just creeps on you every day from the minute you set foot on on premise. Okay, we'll see how you feel fair. about it. Yeah, Thanks I mean, for mansplaining sexual harassment with Jesse, Mike. I just appreciate ball, it. So, <laughs> well, as long as he's funny, it works. So, <laughs> yeah. Listen, no one's gonna reach Franklin Hall of Fame levels of creepiness. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's some more Here. characters to come. That Garibaldi's point, trying. though. Sorry. No, I'm going? sorry. I just didn't. That's not. I did not get the Franklin level creep vibe that I did. But now that Mike says it, I mean, every single interaction that I had with somebody was them being weird. Like maybe, maybe it is. Maybe so I'm just, just not. Heard, what I heard was Mike was right. See, I do like I the callback. No, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I said often, that. So I'm going <laughs> to take it. I do like also, the callback. No, this though. was nowhere near Franklin, but levels of creep. So this yeah. is. <laughs> I, I do like the callback. Remember in season one, she said, whenever I turn around, Mr. Garibaldi's there. And then the, that's true. And she's, she's like, I'll get an escort for your quarters. And Garibaldi's like, I'll do it. He's right. <laughs> and he was off screen until he popped up. Like, hi, I'm here. <laughs> just Nicole, strolls off the elevator. Like, what's up? Mm-hmm. I was just going to add that. I think the thing with Garibaldi is, yeah, he shoots a shot with her, but he's charming about it. He's fun. There's like something charming and innocent about him, you know? And like when she did tell him I'm going through this, I'm not in the mood. He did stop, but then he made her like laugh. And that's like what she needed in that moment. So I thought it was really sweet, that interaction. I didn't feel it was Franklin esque at all. What I heard was John was wrong. That's all I heard. (laughs) I agree. Speaking of John, John, go ahead. All right, fine. Um, well, so sticking with Talia, though, I had some more questions. So I've had lots of questions with the telepaths as they've been out, and we keep getting more info, which is great. This is maybe a little clarifying question because I didn't understand. So she was there to be a part of the meeting, right? But she only it seemed to have read one side. So is that standard operating procedure when you have a telepath in a, a commercial meeting, a diplomatic meeting, that whoever hired them gets to read them? Like yeah, read the I- other? I think she described it to us in the first season. I can't remember word for word, but she basically uh, announced herself to the other client saying, I've been hired to ensure the negotiations go uh, above board and everything else. So uh, I think if he was not being truthful, I think she would have said that as well too, but he was very much forward. So he didn't really think about it. 
I say, do you? Because in the end, she clearly showed that she will lie. And she will lie to protect things that mm -hmm. she cares about, a.k.a. the psych Yeah. So, that, so I, my question with that was, so again, this is one of those things, because they're very meticulous. And he is, Jim is very good about his world building. I know he didn't write this episode either. But, um, you know, I just think about in, in practical terms, if I was in a negotiation and, you know, let's say I was negotiating with you and you brought in a telepath, I'd be like, cool, we're going to reschedule this meeting until I get my own telepath. I'm going to have a battle of the telepaths because there's no way I'm letting you have an advantage where you get to know for sure if everything I'm saying is true and you can just lie to my face. But it's happened multiple times now. Yes. On interest in that, I had a guy. Right? I mean, no, I, I think, I, think oh, oh. I mean, I think you get told that in the episode, though. I mean, she has been, she wouldn't use this term, but she has been indoctrin indoctrinated into the psych corps since she was five years old. Mm -hmm. The psych corps, we will hear this said early, this is not a spoiler, but we will hear this bef uh, again. The core is mother, the core is father. And she says it here in this episode that her mother, uh, the only person that pops in her head is this one woman who was there to help indoctrinate her for one year. That's her mother. So she's going to lie about for Psychor. Absolutely, she's going to lie about for Psychor. Yeah, I, I, I can't necessarily say I blame her for that because, like, that is all. That's all she knows. She doesn't know anything different. So the fact that, like, at the end when you could tell she was obviously lying about what she saw within Horn's brain, that I really none of that really surprised me, and it's kind of maybe even a sympathetic thing with her, where you can see on her face maybe she knows that she's doing something wrong, but I mean, she can't turn against it. Yeah. That's, uh, that's one thing that I wrote down was that, uh, I don't know if it was just me, but there kind of seemed like a little hesitation at first. Like she almost, uh, told Sheridan what she saw, but then kind but of she back, wanted like, to. Yeah, plus. absolutely. I was mm -hmm. wondering if she's still not sure if she can trust him. Mm-hmm. Well, and remember, too, we're starting to see this. We didn't get really uh, in Ivanova Talia scene in this one, but every time we get in Ivanova Ivan Talia scene, Ivanova is slowly breaking down those barriers that Psychor has built up. We saw this, I think we've seen this at least two or three times now, where Talia is starting to realize maybe Psychor isn't everything it's cracked up to be, but she, she's not there. Yeah. Um, real, real quick, to go back to John's point, though, about the negotiations with the telepath in them. I mean, we even see in negotiations between companies now that you're oftentimes not on equal footing. I mean, I'm going to reference, you know, Kevin, you posted about a local business that had negotiated a sales order basically with a larger retailer. And, you know, I guarantee you that retailer had lawyers upon lawyers upon lawyers that drafted everything, did everything. This small retailer that was trying to break into the space didn't have any of that. I mean, they had maybe one person negotiating on their behalf. So it's not out of the realm of possible, even looking at, you know, with the telepath, depending on the dynamics of the negotiation, whether it's large corporation or smaller, that one party is going to pay for that telepath and the other, for whatever reason, either isn't going to be able to or isn't going to have that power to do so. So for me, that's not necessarily an unrealistic thing. I mean, because there's that power dynamic now within business negotiations of who has the money, who has the upper hand and who can bring what to the table. That part. So first, I'm gonna say I, I didn't necessarily think it was unrealistic, but they haven't dove into that part, the the money part. Which so are you getting that from the show, or are you just interpreting that because of what like real life current events? Because that would be interesting if they talked about that on the show and brought Psychor in as like this capitalist craziness. Because if that's the case, if you can, it's, if they only serve those who can pay, that's an interesting angle that I hope that we get to see and play out. For for commercial telepaths, it has been stated they are paid for their services. So okay. for because remember, Psychor has different divisions. There's the Psychops who are, you know, more your internal police force. But then you have the commercial telepaths uh, who are out and they're paid for their services. Um, and that's been referenced uh, in the show about how they've been paid to be part of the negotiations to do whatever. So that's stated in dialogue. Mm. Okay. Nicole. I was going to say um, when Talia lied at the end and then you saw her in her quarters, like looking up this person, maybe she didn't want to like and this could be just me being the positive person i am maybe she wanted to find out who it was or like get an identification on the person before she actually said i saw this person you know what i mean because then if she just said oh i just saw a person then shared him like well who is it or you know what i mean like maybe she needed to go and dig a little bit more and find out a little bit more on her own so she can start transitioning and realizing oh wait 
these psych core people are bogus as hell and shady. You're so cute and naive. It's fine. I know. I know. <laughs> she just wants to make sure. That's it. Oh, I don't think she's wrong. I kind of read it the same way. Like, right. like Talia was going to go investigate shit herself before getting outsiders, out, outsiders to the core involved. Yeah, but you assume that, and I'm not saying that this is what happens, so don't read into it, but you assume that she's going to bring that information forward. Maybe she's just trying to figure it out so she can go back to Sidecore and say, hey, you guys got a leak. And that's what I assumed she was doing, to be honest. Well, especially because didn't we learn, I don't know how many episodes ago, that the Sidecore has a secret Mars base or Mars facility that I am you know, would be shocked if that doesn't come up soon before I spoil my own predictions later. But <laughs> I think maybe that could be Bureau 13. The Mars base? Yeah. You can bust out the red twine right now, Andrew, if you want to. I just didn't want to bog down. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that it's clearly showed them in the San Diego area. I I was kind of confused at first when I saw it because I was like, what? I honestly thought, you know, we've had those moments where they've inserted a clip somewhere that didn't wasn't supposed to be there or like what they used to show before they went to commercials and stuff like that. I honestly, for a second, was like, I don't know what that had to do with anything. And then when we saw it again later. Um, but I was going to, I was just going to agree with Nicole. That's kind of how I took it too, was she was going to just gather more information. Now, do I think she's going to walk up to Sheridan and, um, hand it to him? Probably not, but, um, maybe. And, you know, but what the, her intent right now, is that what it was? I don't believe it. I believe she just wanted to gather more information and kind of know more about it before she says anything to anybody. John? On that same point, to keep it going, I'm going to go ahead and again burn another little prediction uh, because Scott had mentioned, right, that story. So I thought that story was interesting for two reasons. The first of which obviously paints more of a background um, about Psycor uh, itself and then how they bring on, you know, new, you know, basically toddlers and indoctrinate them. But I thought it was interesting that she said it was a woman. Uh, I think the name was Emma. Yeah. Abby. Abby. Sorry. Abby. And I thought, hmm, would it be out of the ordinary if the Bureau 13 woman at the end just turned out to be Abby. So we can really bust out the red yarn right now, the red tape. And uh, my only pushback to that in my own dialogue was, well, she didn't seem like she recognized her right away. However, if you'd only seen someone or hung out with someone for you know a year when you were five and haven't seen them since, you might not recognize them. But I thought with all of the meticulous world building and you know very economical use of words, it was interesting that 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 was this episode. It happened in the same episode. So it wouldn't surprise me if there's an overlap there as well. Nicole? Also, too, if I'm not mistaken, when she was researching this woman she saw in the vision, it said that she was deceased. So I'm also thinking she's probably one of those RoboCop freaks, too. Um, maybe she was like the first one or the prototype. And now she's creating more, almost like a little army so she can control them. Yeah, I tried to freeze frame it. When they showed that computer screen, they didn't have any names or anything on it. It was just a bunch of gibberish. It said Captain, Lieutenant Commander. Like, it was just nothing. Bummer. Am I the only one who kind of thought she looked like uh, Lieutenant Hitchcock from, or Commander Hitchcock from Sequest? For those who, for all <laughs> I know, two of I know you who have seen that show. I don't see it, but. I don't see it either. Maybe Sorry. the hair's cut? Maybe, maybe? maybe, yeah, maybe it was just the hair, yeah. <laughs> Justin. I mean, I don't, John, I, you hit on a really good point that I didn't even think about that maybe there's some kind of personal connection between Talia and whoever the head of this Bureau 13 is, even, even if she is the head. Um, I don't think she's one of the quote unquote cyborgs, but she's definitely the head of that program. And that just, of course, you know, springs a wealth of wondering within me about how many more are out there and stuff like that so it's i think that you know we don't even know if she is she's just called 13 within the episode but we don't know if she's the head of the bureau we don't really know exactly what her role is but honestly i think that she's probably listed as deceased for security reasons it's not uncommon even back in the cia days to have somebody's entire identity erased just to become a you know cia spook or even look at men in black you know, you lost your entire identity. You were completely erased off the books when you joined the Bureau. So I think that's something very similar then with whoever 13 is, is, you know what? She she's she she is non-existent as far as any official government, you know, records indicate. But that just means that her shadow just grows that much deeper. Yeah, I definitely took it. She wasn't a part of the Lazarus Project 
based on how, um, you know, shared and described the, the procedure and what it basically did. And, you know, she seemed to be fully functioning. So she could be, but I, to Justin's point, I took it more as a disinformation campaign. Um, but on no, that, she runs it though, I think. Well, but on the same topic, she was referencing a he on the ship. Now, unless I misinterpreted something, which I very well could, she said something about he, and, and I still got the impression that she was referencing a he that's still a spy on Babylon 5. Did it, does anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They were referencing think, control. Yeah, I think it's the AI that's called control unless I'm completely wrong in the way that I understand it. But the program that is embedded in probably all EA systems is control just pops up when they enter in a certain sequence or when they say something specific, then that's the AI system that that any of these agents of Bureau 13 report to. Oh, see, I kind of wondered if it was the other person because when they um, showed the fancy porta potties for lack of a better term, and that's what the guy came out of. I thought there were originally two. So I thought that there were two on the station communicating. Like one was the guy who was supposed to carry out the mission. And the other one would be like the supervisor reporting back and making sure it gets carried out. Yeah, there were two containers that said classified cargo. But but Justin, I, so I took it differently. I didn't think she was calling the program control. I thought she was calling the program 13. And I thought she was saying control needs to verify as in like there's a, there's a person, somebody they call control is still on B5. Yeah. So this would be the, the predictions part. But I mean, when I caught that, I thought, oh, so they're setting up that there's still another Bureau 13 spy on B5. Maybe it's somebody we already know. Maybe it's a main character. I mean, it could be, it could be. And I I guess, I guess we'll find out who's right later on down the line. Uh, But the way that I read it is controls the AI. 13 is the woman who was side was the psy cop who's kind of running everything. And then they have agents that have to report to 13 through this control system, but we'll see. That's how I saw it too. But we'll clearly see more. Yeah. How are you going to be right? Are you and Justin going to be right? Yeah. Or none of us are right. Or right. maybe we're both right. We're Who knows? All it's, all <laughs> it's all crazy. <laughs> this is funny. I'm hmm. I'm looking forward to when we jettison all you out the airlock and say who's right and who's wrong, because you're out all, all right and you aren't all wrong. So yay. Random question. Have we met the Takar yet? The Who? Is it wasn't it Takar? Takar? Oh, that alien race the Takar, was meeting yeah, with the, oh, the alien race? No, we have not. No. I didn't think so, but they mentioned they like you know, the chairs. Will we meet them again? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Beyond the rim, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, does anybody want to talk about Bureau 13 more? Because I'm ready for a deeper conversation in that. Justin, go. So Bureau 13, we have a name, finally, of the shadow organization. That's kind of what is taking its talons deep within EarthGov and kind of seems to be controlling everything. Now, Home Guard. You know, we don't know yet what where Home Guard kind of fits into it. Are they part of Bureau 13 or are they just one of many organizations that's kind of secretly controlled? Where does Clark fit in? You know, I'm not 100 percent sure yet if Clark is an active participant in Bureau 13, like is part of this conspiracy to take control of Earth Alliance or it's just a puppet. But I'm definitely kind of here and just curious to hear uh, anyone else's thoughts about what exactly do they think Bureau 13 is? Uh, well, one thing that I wrote down, uh, and this is kind of going back to uh, the, the lady at the end, uh, the theory that she's a. Uh, one of these rebel cops, uh, maybe a Bureau 13 is an army of sleeper agents uh, run by Psycor. Yeah, I so did get was a, it? I did. John, John had said something about Psycor being the ultimate enemy, I think, at one point. But sorry, Jesse, go ahead. No, no, you're OK. I just was going to agree with Andrew. I got the vibe that it was a group. Um, it's not specifically one person because, you know, she's like he's ours or whatever she said, which made me think that they were building this group a bunch of dead people that are now in this group. I mean, the way Sheridan described it, right? I mean, he's described a bureau. I mean, you'd think of mm-hmm. organization. Um, again, which was an interesting line from Sheridan, right? I trust pe- individuals, not organizations. Um, now we know why he trusts individuals, not organizations, because apparently for the last six years, there's, there's been a, a deep state, which half this country might be happy to hear, um, 
And so I assume it's a number of people um, working in various departments. Um, I know that they, my my assumption is that they very much link back in with, you know, the, the earth force psychos we've seen before the psycho, apparently now psychos we've seen before. I think they're all in league together. Um, My wonder if we're just kind of throwing stuff against the wall here is like, you know, what's their actual ultimate goal. Is it just to win this Mars you know, independence fight? Like, is, is that what all of they've been going for? What's their, their ultimate goal? Just to keep the status quo. I mean, Justin, this is where I really need to th- strap on your tinfoil and let me know what you think Bureau 13's <laughs> mission statement is. Complete domination. If, if you look at any of these secret shadow organizations over time, you can even go back to, you know, the Third Reich and some of their shadow organizations that they had, which were just to, not only serve the state, which in this case would be Earth Alliance, but to further the goals of the state and which would be to reassert and make Earth Force the dominant power in the galaxy. And I think that's where you see even senators who may not even realize that they're serving this Bureau 13 try and poke holes in, you know what, Babylon 5 is supposed to be neutral territory, but then yet they still expect Sheridan to report on anything that happens that may be in Earth's best interest, uh, which has been going on, you know, I think from the from the beginning of the show, pretty much, from when you whenever you have to, the Senate be involved in any of this. Um, but I think at the end of the day, I think Bureau 13's ultimate goal is to make humans the dominant species in the galaxy, not in number, but in power. And well, I think that, go ahead. Well, no, so I want to follow it up because I don't necessarily disagree with you, but I guess perhaps it's just a matter of we haven't seen it yet. But so why haven't we seen them involve themselves or again, could because we haven't seen it, but why haven't they stuck their nose in like other species matters, right? Like why aren't they? How do we know they haven't? I, again, I mean, we don't, but I, I just, they they're flexing their muscle so much more specifically in human issues and, and earth issues. Well, you have to, well, you have to take control of your own house before you can go try and take other people's houses. You know what I'm saying? So like if Bureau 13 is trying to pretty much take everything over, well, they need to take full control of earth. Well, how do you do that? You get rid of a president who's very pro alien and you put somebody in place who we don't really know. We haven't really heard much from Clark since he took over, but still just, you know, assassinating Santiago. Now Clark's in charge, you know, where is where is that going to go among the rise that we've seen from the very beginning of the series of, of anti-alien sentiment on Earth? And then you have the home guard who just kind of feeds into that and commits acts of violence against not only aliens, but people friendly to aliens. To me, if you have kind of Bureau 13 kind of pulling the puppet strings over all of it, that's just kind of what makes that. That's kind of where I see Bureau 13 is they're still trying to take control of dominate Earth before then they try to move on to different races. And now you have the shadow people where is this going to become like a two front war? Like I think myself and I think even you, John, and a few other people have maybe suggested in the past where maybe this is going to become a two front thing. So one last thing real quick, Justin, did you hear? So they showed the president speaking when they showed 13 and you could just yeah. about couldn't make it out. I don't know if you or anybody else, did anybody else make out what he was saying? It was the exact same video we've seen. It was uh, the exact yeah. same video from season, uh, this first episode when, of season two. Mm-hmm. When 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 Clark took office, yeah. Yep, yep. They, they they lifted that audio and video from that episode. Okay. So we've seen nothing new from Clark so far this season. Nope. Jesse, you you guys talk about how he was like pro humans, but RoboCop was very anti Earthers. Like he, you know, he said multiple things about killing Earthers and and whatnot. And I couldn't figure out, I guess, if that was because of the function in his brain or was that related to the group that he was tied to? So I couldn't, like, you guys are pulling things that I can't, my, like, my brain doesn't connect at that, at that level, I guess, at this point. I think, I I think, go ahead, Justin. Well, I think what you're saying, Jesse, is a little bit of both. Horn was very anti-Earther. 
Um, mm-hmm. Otherwise, he wouldn't have le- been leading the Free Mars movement. He wouldn't have been leading the rebellion uh, to secede uh, from Earth. Uh, but at the same time, he was being controlled by somebody from Earth where he was going to show up. They were basically going to try to, and this is kind of the way I kind of read it, they were using Horn to try to take Carter back to Mars you know, basically saying Horn's still alive. So all of their machinations they could blame on the Mars movement to have further reason to clamp down harder. You had me until the very end there, Justin. The way I see really? it, yes, he's a Manchurian candidate. Uh, okay. Basically there to, but I don't think he was ever there to take Carter back because he was having jumbled programming by the time he got to Amanda Carter. His thing yeah, was I just so... His thing was to soak discontent. He wa- they I, wanted- thought at, I thought at one point they said something about 13 in the discussions towards the end where she was saying that the mission failed and he was unable to take her to escape to Mars. With no, her. they and said I, he was I unable guess, to I kill guess I the associated other target. Carter. No, okay. and then the other target was Talia. Remember they said you need okay. to take Talia out. I and think he, he failed at doing that. I think I misassociated. I thought maybe they were talking about yeah. Carter with that. So that was maybe just a misassociation with me. Yeah. So the way the way I see it is you have this agent, then the uh, the other the Psychor person said, You're ours now, that we control him now, or whatever she said. And mm-hmm. so the whole point is have a free Mars guy go in there and start starting shit, so then free Mars looks bad. So okay. well, that's what they're using him for. At least that's my thought. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you, Shot. They said on the second part that he could also, as an ancillary benefit, tarnish Carter as well. Yeah, and then she said that too. Yeah. She's like, well, you're going to make me look bad because yeah. no one knows that she was also um, a terrorist or whatever you want to call her. Yeah. And it, and it destroys her reputation and then everything that she's trying to work for. So Which, yeah. I really, I, you guys haven't hit on this too much. I really do appreciate the idea that Mars independence is not from revolution. It's from economic independence. And Mm -hmm. that's the whole point of this conversation is she knows that we can't win this fight. We just tried and we lost because off screen we lost. But if we become a trading partner and become economically independent, then we'll be free. And I love that idea that not all wars are fought with swords and guns and everything else. Some wars are economic. And I appreciated that. Um, So I agree with you. And I was going to mention, but like, I mean, lots of wars, I think you could almost always make the case. I shouldn't say almost always. That's an overgeneralization. But lots of times have been about economics. I mean, the American Revolution essentially was also about economics. Everyone say, oh, well, it's because you're, you know, you're passing laws. I don't have a say in no representation. It's like, yeah, but the laws that they were really mad about were the taxes. (laughs) It's money. It's always about money. Right. So once you grow certain uh, a certain status, you want your own money. You want to control your own financial destiny. Um, I thought that was great. I, the only other thing I was going to mention um, before I give away to Nicole was it's funny because you called her a terrorist. And I thought the actual interesting point was her making a distinction that free Mars wasn't, it didn't start out as a terrorist organization or it wouldn't have been classified as a terrorist organization, right? It started out what it sounded like was that it started out as a peaceful, nonviolent group just advocating for Mars's independence. And then as sometimes, unfortunately, always happens, bad actors tend to take over and, you know, ruin it, a bad apple for the, for the rest of the bunch. And then it turned into what it is. And I wouldn't be surprised since we only kind of hear one side of the story. If, you know, the only reason they're called terrorists is because the people they're fighting against call them terrorists because earth calls them terrorists, right? There's, there's, there's usually a fine line between terrorism and revolutionaries and freedom fighters. And, you know, you, it's wh- whichever side you're on gets, you know, is who calls who the terrorists. So I thought that was a uh, fascinating part of the episode mm-hmm. that I've nearly into enough. Nicole, what do you got? Um, so unrelated to what my original point was going to be, one thing I did want to point out was at the very end, when the Bureau 13 lady was talking to the computer, she was saying that, um, you know, phase two had not been accomplished because the the subject was taken out. So um, you know, even if, you know, he didn't destroy Talia, I don't think she was necessarily a target originally it's because she saw into his mind so then they're like oh yeah kill that bitch too but like originally there was a second phase um that was never done on babylon 5 so um 
I, I did. I did notice that I wrote that down, that there was something else that was not accomplished, which is probably going to be a problem in the future. Um, but when it comes to Bureau 13, my thought is, is that Bureau 13 is probably being run by Clark. Clark is probably a dummy. Clark might even be a cyborg Robocop himself. Um, and he's got the purse strings telling him what to do kind of thing. But I thought with the Bureau 13 thing, I was like, you know, Home Guard is kind of like nothing compared to them because it seems like they're so much deeper in the depths and the levels of the government that, you know, Home Guard is kind of like small potatoes and they might even be running Home Guard, you know? So I feel like Bureau 13, the PSYCOR, and Clark and the assassination of Santiago. I feel like all of that is connected. And I do think whoever said about the twofold war, I think that we've got this fraction of the earth movement wanting to take over the world and the universe. And then we've got the creepy murder spider death ship people who are going to come in and be like, nah, fam, I could erase you with a snap of my fingers. You ain't shit. So I feel like it's going to, the shit's really going to hit the fan because from what I can gather is I think that there's going to be more un- uprising with this Bureau 13 bullshit. But then those creepy spider people are off in the distance building their army from the previous episode about that guy was going to them. They thought, you know, that demon guy that they killed. So I feel like both are probably building and they're going to end up. I think the Bureau 13 and all that is going to end up either getting wiped out by the creepy spider murder death ships or they're going to want everyone to join together to try to fight them. You know, so it's like they're going to come in and be like, we're taking over. And then like, oh, wait, no, fam, we need your help. You know, so I feel like there's something big is going to happen. And I, I think that that I don't know, I just have a. And I could be completely wrong, and I probably am, but I feel like this Bureau 13 thing is way deeper and way more involved than any of us think, the newbies at least. And I really think that, uh, why do they keep showing the same Clark video over and over again? Why haven't we heard anything new from him? You know, I bet you he's a cyborg or being controlled too. Um, And also... It made me think how many I think somebody said this already, but how many more of those little Robocop fuckers are out there? You know, I think they've been building those and building those and building those. And so there's a whole army of Robocop fucks out there. So I think I just I don't know, man, there's just so many ways that this can go. And I feel like I've read twine this uh, to death, so I should probably stop talking. I feel like I agree with a lot of you guys, but I think this goes even deeper than we know. I love do, 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 do. <laughs> sweet, sweet Nicole slapped on her tinfoil hat and just went off, son. Drop the. <laughs> <laughs> I went. <laughs> it's all connected. It's all I went connected. ham. I totally just went ham. I'm going to go put a tinfoil hat on. <laughs> yeah, that president fucker's a cyborg. Get at me, son. I loved it. Kevin, what do you got? A couple of quick little nuggets. I really lo- enjoyed the whole um, co- comedic relief with the whole Mr. Wizard thing. I thought that was really funny. I also thought oh, that. Oh, yeah the character development with Garibaldi, which, you know, can go kind of missed with everything else going on in this episode, you know, talking to Talia about his dad. I thought that was a really good moment. I think one of you alluded to the fact that when he was talking about his dad to Franklin, when he was going to make the Banya Cauda, that you thought he was just full of shit to uh, get him off his case. But, you know, we learned in this one that it, that was definitely a real thing. And the last thing I want to mention is I, I did think it was interesting that Ivanova's distrust of Psycor does not translate to distrust of Talia. I found it interesting that she stood up for, for Talia as much as she did. Yep. I, I, uh, I definitely think that, that that dynamic will be something to watch. As much as she's tearing down Talia's walls, Talia is helping Ivanova get rid of her biases too. It's nice. Blake. So one thing just to comment on, because there's been a lot of running discussion amongst this group around the CGI and especially early on with looking at the CGI on particularly modern screens and projections and whatever. But the one thing that we've mentioned when it got into CG or got into season two, the CGI has gotten consistently better, both from a budget standpoint, but also from just how fast the tech behind it was advancing. So the scene in this one uh, was actually where the Earth Destroyer fired on Abel Horn's uh, fighter and blew out the cockpit of it. 
that was actually more detailed than what most screens in the nineties would show. I mean, you watch that now on a high definition television, you've got the glass blowing out, you've got the, the environment sucking out and you can actually see debris and stuff flying out of that ship when it was fired on. So just the CGI advances from where we were in season one uh, to the detail they're putting into the renderings for the ships and the scenes they're doing in CGI. Now Uh, the other part that I did want to note too, because I was reading through the Usenets and one of the big questions, uh, this is one of the few times in B5 when a physical model was actually used. The San Diego Wasteland was actually a physical model. That part was not CGI. Mm -hmm. Uh, So this is like the one episode where there was actually a physical model of something in the show. I still say he took it from the uh, Captain Power set. Still think that. Oh, I'm sure he did. And to kind of pick up where from where you are on, Blake, and I don't know if maybe I just didn't notice it before this episode, but the sets look a lot more open than they were definitely in season one, even to the fact where the graphics that they're using through the windows where you see into the station, Mm -hmm. which then totally gives me the Mass Effect Citadel vibes. Like when I was looking at those scenes where you can look into the interior of the station and be, okay, now you can see it it just makes everything look more open instead of how closed and compact everything was prior to that. Well, like in in season one for uh, Sinclair's office, they just had like the section with the desk and the little bit of wall behind it. Mm-hmm. That, that was the set. Season two, they built out more of it. Now you've got this larger, what looks to be a larger, more expansive office. It's just because they built the sets out more. Yep. Um, they also enlarged the Zocalo set, I believe. They created more to that. And they also expanded the gardens sets a little bit in season two. And some well, of the, the sets restaurant are now... set looks a lot bigger too. Well, that restaurant set wasn't there. We didn't yeah, have that's new. season. Was one. that not there? Yeah. Is that no. new? Okay. Yeah. And we also um, got the Cobra Bay, which is new as well, too. But the more important thing, too, is some of them are connected. I think, uh, Justin, you weren't on this episode, but I think John pointed out we had our first walk and talk a few episodes mm-hmm. ago where they were able to go from one set to another set without a cut because they're starting to I remember to seeing that in together. the episode. Yeah. Yeah. John, what do you got? Yeah, I just want to point out a, a couple of quick things in terms of some command stuff. I thought Ivanova, again, at the beginning, I know it was small, but <clears throat> showing off her growing diplomacy skills, you know, with the chair, with the setup, with her involvement, really leaning into this lieutenant commander role. So I hope, you know, she kind of has small parts to play in the last couple of episodes, but I hope that continues to grow. Um, and then Scott, you mentioned a little bit, but again, seeing contrasts and compares with Sheridan and Sinclair, you know, obviously how you said um, Sheridan handled the senators versus how we've seen Sinclair handle the senators. And then a note I wrote down before, thankfully Garibaldi addressed it was, you know, the difference in Sheridan not immediately sharing all of his info with Garibaldi, which was, you know, uh, it's his head of security. So you would think, hey, shouldn't you let this guy in on the no? And, you know, you still see that distrust. And again, Garibaldi references and says, look, I know, you know, you're not as close as, as I was to Jeff. So I get it. But, you know, hey, you got to trust me. So again, to uh, I think it was Blake or Kevin's point about character development, you know, showing that relationship growing a little bit more. Sheridan is clearly trusting Garibaldi saying, Hey, you know, I'm going to give you this info on this crazy deep government conspiracy and I need you to not say anything. And, you know, I, I thought it was great just showing them grow a little bit more. This is the kind of stuff that I mentioned a few episodes ago that's going to take us time to, to see about Sheridan. The last little nitpick I have, though, was there anyone living next to or staying next to that room? Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> if they were, Red Sector's got a few open rooms now. They said nothing. They were just like, all right, let's get out of here. It was a massive explosion. Good luck. So that's I, all. I do, you know, to Jesse's point about how the opening credits spoil stuff. And when they talk about the Great War, you got one of the scenes here where uh, uh, Sheridan is running and gets knocked over by the explosion that came from this episode. So no spoilers there anymore. I think, okay, can I just address that real quick? Because somebody said that on YouTube too. They're like, just because it's in the, the main credits doesn't mean it's a spoiler. That's not <laughs> the what The comments I are coming hot, hard and heavy for you, Jesse. <laughs> they are. Listen, I'm starting to like rub some people the wrong way. But that's not, that wasn't the point of that. That was like me trying to have a prediction that I, because I did it, right? How many times a, a, a freaking week do you hear me go, I don't have any questions. I don't have any predictions. So it was just like, this is the first time. We literally had the same conversation in the podcast the week before because I had just listened to it. And then I was like, well, shit, I just said the same thing that we just talked about. But it was the first time that I had listened to it, like literally ever. So, you know, whatever. That was me trying to be funny and 
YouTube hates me, so it's okay. <laughs> you have adoring fans, Jesse. Let's go ahead and wrap it up there with our discussion and move into questions and predictions. For those who are just joining us, the newbies will give any lingering questions and predictions they may have because they have not watched past A Spider in the Web. And then we'll jettison out the airlock and answer all those questions beyond the rim with the, those who have watched the whole show. So let's go to Emily first. Questions and predictions. Um, I actually don't really have much this week. I'm just kind of wondering if Talia will eventually like turn against Psychor or realize that they are very questionable, haven't been honest about any of their dealings and have manipulated a lot of people to get whatever their ultimate end goal is, which is likely money and power. John, okay. questions, predictions. Questions. Well, actually, uh, question. Why do why do like movies and TVs feel the need to put the title, like to say the title out loud, like Sheridan said it at the end. It always bothers me. I'm always like, why, who cares? I got it. Like, the, the guys from uh, cinema sins on YouTube, whenever that happens, they say roll credits, you roll heard credits. the title, roll credits. Um, so questions, uh, we found some of them out here, but, um, so to 13, is she really dead or is, uh, that just disinformation? Um, if she is dead, is she, is she maybe the first or the best part of the Lazarus project to, to come back? The last uh, best hope for the Lazarus project. Uh, is all of Psychor corrupt? Is it just a little bit inside? Is there little offshoots that also, you know, touch other departments? So the follow-up question, you know, how big is Bureau 13? Has it invaded every aspect of, of every department? Talia clearly knows more than she's let on, but how much more? You know, what exactly does she know? Again, kind of leaning on that is all of Psychor corrupt. I mentioned earlier was was Emma a nifty bit of hiding who 13's real identity is. I will answer that one because JMS answered that one the Usenet. She's way too young to be Emma. Uh, oh. Because when you just think about the math on that, Talia is in her, what, 30s? And she was five when she was at Psychor. And this person was an adult figure then. So she's got to be at least 20-ish years older when... Uh, Talia's five, so that means at least twenty-five, at least. She's gotta be pushing sixty. So she's yeah. gonna, yeah, she's gonna be in her late fifties-ish. So JMS did throw out there on the Usenets back when people were watching the first time that the, the age difference there is just too great. A quick aside, so okay, I'll take it. Obviously, you know, um, but I thought when she was sounding, I took it more like a like a high school, like just she said an older student. So I assume mm. they. You know, student out. So I, I took the age range to be much smaller. Otherwise, it's far creepier if you have a mid twenties or eighteen year old doing that to a five year old. That makes it entirely creepier. As if psycho ah. creepy enough. Yeah, I'm already saying, isn't it creepy enough either way? Unbelievably. Yeah. But now, if you're mentioning it, it's like an eighteen plus year old soothing or doing whatever she said mentally to a five year old. That's Franklin levels of creepy. You may be right, but even if she was 15, that would mean she's at least 10 years older than Talia. And like I said, JMS threw it out there that, that people were asking the same question on the news nets, and he's like, the, the age difference is just too great there. Okay. John, can we call it the Franklin scale? <laughs> yes. Is that a, is that a one on or a scale of one to five scale. Franklins, yeah, how creepy is it? <laughs> yes. Mike Wars, they're, they're getting to that Franklin Hall of Fame level. Um, all right. And then predictions. Uh, again, I've mentioned some, uh, I think that we're going to see the Mars independence movement, uh, become far more of a, a larger storyline, uh, this season. Um, I do think to Nicole's point, it will bring up, a, an interesting conflict between what is going on with the shadows and what's going on with, uh, Bureau 13. Um, I do, my mind just went totally blank. Oh, I had something else. I literally just lost my entire time of thought. Excellent. You said it earlier and I've got it. There's another agent called Control who is still on the station. Yes, thank you. That's it. And then, yep. yeah. Okay, perfect. You, you intersperse like a little salt and pepper your questions throughout, so we get them. Is season two is going to start getting infinitely better very soon. And now that we're past those other crappy episodes. Well, I'm next excited. episode's a Londo episode, so you're going to get jolly off that. No, oh, I cannot wait. That's all I got. Jesse, questions, predictions. Make the YouTubers it's happy, Jesse. Yeah, just <laughs> so I watched the intro. No, I'm kidding. Um, so does Jakar come back? Because I feel like we haven't seen him in forever. Clearly, he does, right? I my question is how how much more do we see? I guess of San Diego 
Cause that was one thing that when I was watching it, I was like, Oh, this is um, new and so different. Um, and I get, I don't have any real questions. I'm just trying to make people not hate me. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then my prediction, I'm going to say it again and I'm doubling down. I'm going to ship Ivanova and Talia because when they asked her about her today, she got this look on her face. And I maybe it's because of the, the interview that we did with her and how she said that she is bisexual. But I, um, she every time she talks about her, she gets, again, these like kind of like, I don't know. There's a glimmer in her eye that I notice every single time. So it might be a personal glimmer and like not so much a show glimmer, but I think there was at some point something there. Damn you, Claudia. Damn you. We called that questions. way before she ever even said that. To us. That's why it wasn't really a spoiler. You guys right. were shipping people left and right. Andrew, questions, predictions. Yeah, I think I really only have uh, one prediction coming away from this episode. I think because we kind of saw, saw like it looked like maybe a a seed was being planted. I think at some point Talia will betray or uh, expose Psychor, but at the cost of her life. Because mm. as Scott has said, people will die. <laughs> people will die. Life. People will die. If they die, they die. They die. I just watched Creed 2 a few days ago. It holds up. Justin, questions, predictions. I'm going to try and do, I mean, really everybody's covered a lot of the questions that I had, um, especially John. So thanks, John, for doing half my work for me. But I'm going to try and condense two pages of shit. Oh, for God's um, sakes. Back to lunch, folks. Here we go. It is something a little bit more manageable. So all I'm going to do is start by saying I think Bureau 13 is going to kind of build into some kind of totalitarian regime, probably with Clark as the figurehead. Again, I don't know if Clark is actively involved or if he's just a puppet. But I think that's kind of where Earth Alliance is going towards. And I think that's something that we talked about very early on in the series. Garibaldi and Sheridan will become a lot more closer and be working together a lot, especially with some of this conspiracy stuff. Really, I, I more of a hope. I hope we see more of Amanda Carter. I liked her character. Um, I want to see more of kind of her trying to put Taro's vision into practice and see... Where does that take Mars in terms of it's trying to gain its own independence? Will they be able to do it peacefully or will it be able to, or will it turn violent again? Stay tuned. And then Project Lazarus, um, I really think that there's going to be a lot more. Horn's not the first one. I really don't believe so. Um, so there's going to be more agents out there. You know, again, like I said in the last episode, I'm excited to be talking about sleeper agents again. Now all of this other red string stuff is going to come into play. And I think there's going to be a lot more of these uh, of these agents out there. And the only thing I guess the only question that I have uh, left is I'm, I'm, I'm going to call her Agent 13 because we don't have a name yet. What is Agent 13 in relation to the rest of the Psychops? Do they know she exists? Is she above, like, let's say, Bester? Like, what is she in the whole uh, dynamic of everything? So, and maybe how does Talia know her? Because I got I have a funny feeling Talia, Talia knows exactly who she is. You're absolutely right. There's at least one more Lazarus person. And it's Commander Shepard, right? Dun, dun, dun. It literally was not. called Lazarus and he had a chip in his head. It, it was. <laughs> Just saying. I love Mass Effect of Death. Bioware aped Babylon 5 beyond belief. Yeah. I, I'm noticing that. I'm noticing that a lot more. Yeah. yeah. And you ain't, you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, uh, I can't wait. Before I go to Nicole, John, you said you had one you want to insert. So another prediction. Uh, so Sheridan obviously went against what the Senator asked. Um, and as I mentioned with kind of seemingly siding with free Mars, I think that that will come his disobedience to earth Alliance will be a um, pain point in this season and will, um, you know, test his ability to maintain his leadership of B5. Okay. Nicole, questions, predictions. A lot of my questions were asked, but who's Bureau 13? Who's in charge? Who's behind it? Who's pulling the purse strings? Is Home Guard part of Bureau 13? Is Home Guard separate? Does Home Guard even mean shit compared to Bureau 13? Like, I just want to know. Also, I don't think Talia knows the person that she saw um, in the vision, but uh, I feel like I honestly want to know if the woman, the psychop, is um, a Robocop Lazarus effect person. I keep forget the name. Um, I want to know if she's one of the, you know, creations or whatever. Um, as far as predictions go, I think Clark is either 
a RoboCop himself or being controlled by money and he's in charge of this whole thing. I think he was in on the assassination of Santiago and it's because he's part of this Bureau 13. Um, I think that prediction wise that Bureau 13 is probably going to get their asses kicked by the creepy spider murder death ships, or they're going to ask every other human and every other person for help and join forces. I, I just don't know which way it's going to go. Um, and I said a lot of this earlier. So I think uh, the only other prediction I have is I think Talia is going to either get with Garibaldi or Ivanova at some point. I'm with you on that, Jesse. I'm shipping that too. Oh, and will we see more of Amanda Carter? Is she going to come back around? Um, but yeah, that's it for me. Have fun laughing at me beyond the rim, guys, because I know you're going to chuckle at my thoughts here. Oh, we'll, Nicole, they're going to be laughing at all of us. So I'm already say we'll laugh at Justin first. Not that Absolutely. for any reason that we just laugh at Justin. It's fine. Wow. <laughs> it's a good hobby to have. Everybody needs a hobby. And I'm glad that I'm yours, Scott. Oh, yes. You are living rent free in my head, friend. Rent free. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That will do it for the newbie section. And we will go ahead and have them leave us so we can talk about all these questions and predictions and discuss who's right and who's wrong and that's the fun part and they hate me for it so it's great remember for those who are leaving us to make sure you like and subscribe and follow we absolutely appreciate reviews as well too so please make sure that you put a review in on your podcast app of choice or if you're on youtube click that subscribe and that notify button so you hear about all of our stuff when it comes out and next week we will be talking about soulmates which i'm sure john is going to love actually i love the episode too but john's definitely going to probably love this episode so until next week when we discuss soulmates i have been scott and with me as always has been tin foil hat in person justin emily andrew john jesse kevin nicole <laughs> mike's on his phone Son of a bitch mike <laughs> <laughs> and blake and justin i think you're gonna have to give the tin foil hat over to nicole she beat you this week yeah i was crazy okay sorry hey, everybody i gotta go to the bathroom Oh, for God's sakes. The man's got a bladder of a 60-year-old. And, and I'm going right. to go buy stock in tinfoil companies. Yeah, or right. Butterflies Incorporated. So You guys have done this to me, okay? I've never been like this before, but this show makes me go off the deep end. Oh, you just wait. <laughs> really? Season, you just wait until season three and four, my dear. You're blaming oh, us for this? <laughs> no, just Scott. Thank you for listening to Gray 17, a Babylon 5 podcast. You can find all the places to listen to this podcast and links to our social media accounts at anchor.fm slash gray17 podcast. We want to hear from you, so please join the discussion on Facebook and Twitter. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review. Gray 17 is a part of the Front Row Network and NPR Illinois Community Voices. You can find all the Front Row shows at thefrontrownetwork.com. Gray 17 is not affiliated with, and this podcast has not been prepared, approved, or licensed by Warner Brothers or any other owners of the Babylon 5 copyright. All audio clips included in this podcast are the intellectual property of their respective copyright holders. They are included here for the purpose of review, and no infringement is intended. The opening and closing Babylon 5 themes are available from Falling Matter on YouTube. And what's out there? The rim. And beyond that? The truth. Welcome back to Beyond the Rim. Again, for those who have not watched Past the Spider in the Web, there will be spoilers here, so you should see yourself out now. First off, guys, I, I love the fact that these are especially Justin and Nicole are so excited about Bureau 13 and so excited that we have a name to this thing now. And I also love the fact that we're never going to hear from them again for a couple of different reasons. One, I, I think in the end of the day, it's going to just turn into Psychor, but they don't know that yet. But Two, actually something happened here legally. So when Larry Dottilio and JMS came up with Bureau 13 for this episode, they didn't have the Googles back then, so they didn't Google Bureau 13. If they did, they would have found out that Bureau 13 was a tabletop game that was already out. Oops. So JMS did say in the Usenet that he reached out to the company afterwards, did a mea copa, company was fine, 
we don't know what happened at that point. Probably nothing because uh, not much you can do at that point. But they made sure to never refer to Bureau 13 ever again. <laughs> and JMS's response when people ask, well, what happened to him? Organizations changed their names. So they changed their name. <laughs> So I, I'm looking forward to Justin asking every week for the next month or two, when's Bureau 13 coming back? And we're just going to be chuckling because it doesn't at all. For all of our newbies, when you listen to this episode, you're already going to hate us, but now you're really going to hate us when you yeah. hate us. If you're, re- if you're hate listening at this point, newbies, and it's 2026, sorry. We're not sorry. Yeah, that's true. I'm not sorry. <laughs> Let's dive into the questions and predictions. And based on that whole Bureau 13 is not going to come back, we're just going to go ahead and skip over any discussion of Bureau 13 because it doesn't matter. So let's go into the first question. And that is, the first question was, is all Psycor corrupt or is it just pockets of Psycor? It's all of it at this point. Pretty much all of it, yeah. What I do like later on down the road, though, is when we start getting some more Bester episodes, there's at least two times that I can remember, one being the episode at Psycor, which is really really a creepy episode but the other one when he's dealing with his uh girlfriend who's on ice is bester doesn't see it that way bester sees that he is trying to protect his people and trying to protect uh his way of life and they're all the good guys and everyone else is the bad guys but yeah well so can you ever really say that a whole organization is corrupt or you know the people at the top are corrupt or have a yeah. corrupt agenda and everyone else is following orders you mm-hmm. know you know maybe bester does see it like he's the hero in the story and the other question of that, too, is uh, how much does Talia know about Psycor's clandestine operations? Well, which Talia are you talking about? <laughs> I, I'm really surprised these guys didn't latch on. John mentioned that there was somebody else on the station, but then Justin poo-pooed it, which the fact that Justin poo-pooed it was just amazing to me that he didn't go down that rabbit hole. Uh, yeah, I thought it was really interesting that he thought it was the artificial intelligence yeah. and not an actual agent. That was fascinating to me that the the conspiracy theorist was like, nah, not a big deal. Okay. Well, and what's funny is what we'll find out too, is it's what, I mean, it's not an artificial intelligence, but control is the artificial personality, which is the tally we're seeing now. That's the artificial yeah. piece. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting to me that control was labeled as expendable because they were willing to take out Talia. I wonder if that was actually control saying that they're expendable or control just reporting back and then somebody else saying, well, that person is expendable as well, too. So it's interesting that um, that was a decision that was made by somebody in the process that she could be taken out. Of course, we also see that Terminator Henry Winkler didn't really do a good job at it. So, <laughs> but yeah, I'm 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 really shocked that they didn't go down that rabbit hole. And I'm looking forward to when we get to divided loyalties and they start seeing the other side of this thing and see what they think about that. Uh, will we see Amanda Carter again? Nope. We'll see Mars again. We'll see Mars leadership, but not Amanda Carter. How much of San Diego will we get to see? I don't remember having th- them go down that rabbit hole again. Throughout no, because Bureau 13 has gone. I think San Diego has gone too. I mean, it's not the first time we've heard of San Diego. We've heard that it got nuked. Right. Which ironically, JMS used to live in San Diego. So read into that as you will. Did they ever explain in the show what happened to San Diego? Why it was nuked? I thought it was like extremists, wasn't it? It... It definitely, because I, I was watching the Babylon 5 for the first time, guys, and Brent was doing his watch of this, and he wondered if it was the Mimbari, but we got told in season one that it was humans who did it. It was extremists of some sort that nuked San Diego. Mm. I can't remember where. It may have even been like a, U- like a, a Universal Today. kind of thing. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure we heard about it being uh, definitely human and definitely not outside forces. So looking at it, basically it's listed as a act of nuclear terrorism uh, yeah. that took place that destroyed San Diego. So I don't really think that it was anything as I know in some of the external materials, some of the novels, they talk about a world war and some other uh, pieces, but I don't think San Diego was part of that because it, it does list uh, terrorism as the cited reference for that. 
And I think that's JMS once again just saying this isn't Star Trek. Earth is still not fully united, even at this point. There is an Earth dome and there is an Earth president, but even a few years back or a few decades back, there's still infighting, and obviously there's infighting now too. Yeah, I missed last week, but I can only assume you guys had fun with that whole thing about the uh, the woman that they thought out, and her being like, what? Violence is still a thing? <laughs> yeah. We were too busy talking about Franklin being a creep to yeah, get into too much detail. Will Talia eventually turn against Psychor and realize how manipulated they are. No, well, not so much. If if Andrea Thompson hadn't left the show, it, it does make me wonder if that may have been where they would go with it. I think so. If she if she would have assumed a bit of the Lita Alexander storyline, uh, perhaps, and, and been more of a rogue t- uh, telepath. But, you know, it's a shame that Andrea Thompson leaves the show, but at the same time, I, I just don't, I th- she was so underutilized that it's, it's not hard to figure out why mm-hmm. she would want to do that. And remember too, that the, the Lita storyline, a lot of it was meant for, for Ivanova. If Claudia Christian would have stuck around, she would have been with Byron. Mm. So that would have been fun. Ugh, Byron. Let's get into our predictions. Project Lazarus, Horn is not the first. We're not going to hear about Lazarus again, too, but I bet uh, I, I bet that's the case. Well, also, remember, we've seen cybernetic implants before. We saw the Vicar, which also will come back to the Talia story as a flashback. As Garibaldi said, some of these cybernetic uh, experiments worked, but most of them didn't. We won't see any more Lazarus, but we've seen cybernetic ins- uh, before. Well, and just a funny little side note, in the episode with the vicar, the drink that they ordered was the Jovian Sunspot. Yes. Which was Talia dealing with the cybernetic, you know, vicar. And then in this one, Sheridan gets a drink and it's the Jovian Sunspot again. I wonder, did Larry Dottilio write that episode? I think it's also heavily implied that Technomages are more than a little bit cybernetic. I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, I they be use wrong, tech- but that was I, definitely my read. That yeah, I mean, they use technology. They so. can't do the things that they do without enhancement and augmentation. Yeah, and Tilio wrote Death Walker. Yeah, okay. so it, it's a Larry thing. I think he likes Jehovian uh, sunspots and he likes uh, cybernetics. We're going to get very close here soon to where JMS is writing the whole kitten caboodle, but I do enjoy. For the most part, the Tilio episodes, even on the stinkers like TKO, he can get into those character pieces, mm-hmm. and I appreciate that. If not for one thing, I thought this was a good episode. Mm-hmm. I think we're gonna get we're gonna get one more Larry the Tilio episode, which may be his best one in my opinion, and that's Gropos. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry. He also wrote Knives, which by the way is the lowest rated season two episode on Lurker. I don't get. I, I like that one, but we'll see. The episode will be the catalyst of a good relationship between Sheridan and Garibaldi. I think they're they're starting to grow on each other until Garibaldi tries to kill him. But that's a whole other story. Uh, so let's go to the Mars conflict part. Yeah, please. Because yeah. so Mars, we are going to see more of the Mars conflict. That's going to become part of. Uh, future arcs with, especially after Clark's martial law, Mars is one of the colonies that tries to break away and gets pretty heavily attacked. And one of the things we see later is actually Mars independence as part of the uh, interstellar alliance when that all forms up come season five. Mm -hmm. So, and the Mars resistance continues to play a role too, because they were part of uh, helping with Sheridan, both with the shadows as well as with, uh, when they took on earth to overthrow Clark. So we're going to see, we're definitely going to see more of Mars. I think it would have been interesting to see Amanda Carter come back with that role. I don't know if it was just a casting availability thing or what, because we see the uh, woman I'm blanking on the name uh, who will be kind of the leader of the Mars resistance that we get in later seasons. Who ends up becoming head of intelligence for the The Alliance. Alliance. Yeah. I, I think that could have been an Amanda Carter role. I think they could have brought her back from that, but again, actress availability, Scheduling things like that could have interfered, but sure, I, I definitely see a lot in the two overlap of the roles. That's true. Wasn't she thirteen? Isn't her name like thirteen? Or am I wrong? Her name thirteen was the name of the chick in San Diego. In this, episode. I know, but I I think the the girl on Mars when Marcus and Franklin go there, she has a number. Oh, number one. She's number one. That's oh one. yes, she's number one. I'm gonna shut up now. I think the last of it, guys, is the shipping. We've got some shipping comments here. Obviously. Some of the folks think Ivanova and Talia are going to get together, which, as we know, depending on how you read that last scene before Talia gets out of his control, they do. But then there's also some shipping of uh, Garibaldi and uh, Talia, and which makes sense because of the Garibaldi scenes we've seen with her. And also the fact that at this point they're married in real life. So 
I think their chemistry there makes sense. I think they've shipped damn near every character on this show with every <laughs> other character. I mean, it's about time they get one right that somebody sleeps with somebody. And they had to be spoiled by Claudia to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> there was another prediction that Sheridan going against the senator's wishes yes. uh, will lead to, to him struggling to keep command to B5. And I mean, not exactly, but it was certainly heavy foreshadowing. Well, and I think the one thing we haven't gotten into much, because we'll do it again, is Sheridan's keeping of conspiracy theories is not exactly what he lets on, obviously. He is there to test the rest of the crew to ensure that they are loyal and good soldiers, basically. And as we're going to find out soon, it's not really seen if they're loyal to Earth, but loyal to their oaths. So if there is a need for a coup, will they be a part of it or not? And that's why Sheridan's there. So mm-hmm. his working with the conspiracy theories and being one who likes to dabble in the dark state or whatever you want to call it is why he's there. So we're going to definitely hear about more of that. Will Talia eventually expose Psychor uh, at, co- at the cost of her own life? I that's know. true. I mean, after, after Talia gets, uh, gets shown off by Lita, then we definitely know Psychor has been playing around more. And it's actually interesting. We got Talia coming up in the next two episodes. So it's been Talia light. And then we're going to have Talia for a couple of different episodes in a row. And then she's going to get taken off the show. So well, let's go ahead and end it there, guys. I'm looking forward to Soulmates. I don't know if we're going to have many questions, predictions, but it's a damn fun episode to watch with the uh, three horsemen of the apocalypse coming. So. <laughs> But until next week when we talk about that, remember to like, subscribe, follow. Make sure you are uh, checking out our uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube and all that good stuff. And we will be with you next week to discuss Soulmates. Until next week, I am Scott, and with me has been... Mike. Blake. And Kevin. And now we're all going to go pass out because it was a busy day. Good night. Yes. Thank you. Could you at least tell me what badinage means? Ha, 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 ha.